Hello, it's May 24, 2006, and we're, I'm privileged to be sitting here in the, uh, the home of Eldon Lee Pitts, probably one of the oldest uh, living Willisburg football players. Uh, Eldon was born in 1915 and uh, born in New Boston, then moved to Willisburg, and uh, we're real privileged to have him on film tonight, and uh, we'd like to start off by saying thanks for uh, letting us join you tonight, and uh allowing us into your home and then allow us to interview you. And uh, we'd first like to start off and ask you a, a little bit about your childhood growing up, maybe your siblings and, and family, and, and what brought you to Wheelersburg. Well, to begin with, I was born in, in New Boston, all right, but I, I can't remember anything about it because I was only about two years old when we left down there. And the reason we came to Wheelsburg was uh, Dad bought a farm over here uh, in Wheelsburg, and so we moved to the farm, and uh, we, were, we were a large family, and I guess it was a good idea to go to the farm, where there was ten of us kids, and Mom and Dad, so uh, actually uh, I grew up right over there on the farm here in Wheelsburg. I know nothing about New Boston. Uh-huh. Now, when you when you came to Willersburg, you said your dad was a farmer. Yes. And that, did the kids help on the family farm? And uh, I know back in back in the uh, uh, early 1900s to through the mid 1900s, a lot of uh, families were bigger back then. Just sometimes, just for the fact that uh, they needed help on the farm. Well, about all the farmers I knew of, uh, seemed like all of them had big families, and. Uh, as far as uh, work, well, all of us boys worked on the farm, and we didn't have no, no kind of machinery. We had used mules and horses to, for our farming, and uh, we were all all involved in it, including the, the girls. Uh, when the corn came up, they were out there cutting wheat and hoeing the same as the rest of us. Well, that's great. Now, um, in terms of when you came to Willersburg and, and attended Willersburg High School, uh, my understanding is you graduated in 1936, so we're right in the, in the midst of the Great Depression there, and uh, uh, you have talked a little bit about uh, some of the people that had big influence on you as teachers and as coaches back then. If you could share a little bit about uh, some of the people that uh, you really are fond of. Well, uh, it, it's, it, I'm telling you that we had some of the finest teachers, and uh, actually there was Stanley Hall and Osborne and and uh, Comer and Geist, and all of them, they were just out of this world. And, of course, now you got to remember there was other people who helped us, like Mr. Fushi run a shoe shop, repair shop. He repaired our equipment. And uh, the drug store down there, uh, they were they were behind all of us. And if we ever time we had a game, they they had had us over for uh, ice cream. And uh, we just we just plain uh, plain like what we was doing. But uh, all of us were with it. But in high school, after I got up there, well, I was right in the very midst of the depression. And there was a come a time that I couldn't uh, go to school, so I joined the three C's, and I stayed in there ten months, and then uh, I put in a request to uh, get back out and go back to school, which they had granted. And I came back to school then, and I went one year, and uh, I was having hard times again, and I was going to quit. And uh, Stanley Hall called me down to the office and and talked to me and. And he convinced me that I, I wouldn't, uh, I, this wasn't right for me to quit. But, uh, you know, Stanley uh, Hall was a, was a person that uh, that you looked up to at all times. Now, I know good and well, but uh, there was times that we'd, we'd uh, gang up and two of us at a time would study and I read one book. Mrs. Geis one day would come by our desk and lay a book on our desk and never say a word. Or it came from or anything, but we all knew that Stanley Hall had bought it, or one of the teachers. 
it's just just uh, it was just a wonderful thing that uh, and then I, when I played football I had the uh, had the uh, finest coaches in the world and like I told Bob one day or a while back that uh, they were the kind of a person that if I was in combat I'd want to follow because they were just that type of leaders and uh, uh, I would like to just say one thing, Mrs. Guy, she was about four foot tall, maybe just a little better. She wore high heel shoes, and when she'd get mad, she would go around that room and them heels would crack and we know somebody was going to get a shaking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, but she was the finest person that ever was. She, uh, she, she went out of her way to help us, and Mr. Comer would come visit us at our home. He was a high school teacher. Mr. Hall would come if he thought anything was going wrong with us. And uh, it's just, just, it was just a wonderful, wonderful time that I had in that school. And uh, when I come up for my graduation, of course, uh, Mr. Hall died in, there in February of my last year. And when I come up to graduate, I didn't pick up my diploma because uh, uh, I had left that day that I graduated. I'd left for Cincinnati to join the military, the Navy, and I stayed uh, stayed in there 30 years. But uh, when I uh, when I left, one of the biggest things was in on my mind always was it was Osborne and Fowler and Hall and Comer and Geist. In fact, like I told Bob, when I graduated and knew that I was finished with the school, as a, being a boy, you'd think this wouldn't happen, but I went out to the barn to feed the horses and the cattle, you know, and the milk, and I walked on around behind the barn and I couldn't help but cry because it had come into my mind that this is all finished now. And I had a brand new life starting. Mm -hmm. But you know that's good for anybody. Because you know you can't live one life always as a young man. You're going to have to move into something more as an adult. And I think it's uh, even though I was no longer in school, that the, the uh, remembrance of them helped me. Well, it sounds like you had some real fine people looking out for you. And, and it sounds like Mr. Hall and some of those other people were people that, just like we have in Willsburg today, that will go out of the way to help other people that maybe are struggling. And uh, um, In terms of your football days, I know you played a couple of years of football at Willsburg High School. Could you talk a little bit about some of the struggles that you guys went through back then, uh, getting things started and everything? Well, the worst thing was to try to get a uniform. And... Uh, we would, I don't know where we got a hold of some uniforms, and you know, we got the shirts, you know, the black, orange and black, but uh, we could, we didn't have enough uniforms to go around. We only, I think it was, I think we had 17 men yeah, for football, and if one of us got hurt and had to come out, well, we had to shed part of our uniform so he could relieve us, but uh, we had, to, like I said before, we had, a bunch of farm boys, all of them was farm boys, and, and uh, there wasn't very many teams around who could stand up against us. It was a wonderful, wonderful bunch of boys. They're all gone now. You know, uh, I was talking to the to one of our uh, people that's still left in this class, and, and there's only, out of the 54 of us, there's only, uh, I think, nine of us left. And out of the football team, I think that I'm the only one left. You're the only one left. Yes. That's amazing. Okay, now, I know that you've shared with Bob and, and Coach Eaton some of the things uh, that went on even before you could practice in terms of in the summer, uh, kind of some of the things the coaches did with you to get you in shape, and, and then maybe so, if you could share some of the struggles that you went through to actually practice on a, a practice field. Well, we didn't have no field. Uh, the people like Duff down there would uh, he had a cow pasture there. He let us uh, practice in, on it. Uh, the evening while before we could practice, why we'd run down there and we'd carry our shovels. We'd have to clean the cow pasture <laughs> before we could play. And uh, same thing uh, when we we had another place we could play, but uh, 
they let us play them, uh, but uh, if, if it rained or anything, it stayed flooded. Uh-huh. So we had a hard time there, and uh, but we just, as far as track and stuff like that, we never had a track. We'd just go out somewhere in the field and let us out of track and run. Right. And uh, like uh, we had our track meets out there behind the old high school, which is one of the most beautiful buildings that I ever seen. So they ever tore it down. But when we made a track back there, of course it was a dirt track. But we never had no such thing as gravel on or anything like that. Right. But uh, we, but we bought our own uh, track shoes and stuff like that, that are shorts and running clothes. Now, I think you shared, uh, did you share with Bob that something uh, unique about the track at Wheelersburg was that it was on the side of a hill and you actually had to run yeah, well, uh, at an the, angle? That was the one on the back of the, uh, back of the uh, uh, high school that we had up there, a field back of it. Uh, that was uh, that's where our truck was. We went up, we had to make our own track. We went up there and dug on it and leveled it out as much as we could. The lower side it was still downhill, but you come <laughs> around, you just come and you come around, you go around that, that, that uphill part of it. Why you had a little bit of, of an incline, but we laid out a pretty good track, and that's where we beat Portsmouth, which you know always we just. Plane beat them so bad that they went home. I mean, mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, anytime you beat Portsmouth and you're a pirate, it's a, well, I should say back in your day, yeah. you're a buccaneer. Anytime you can beat Portsmouth, it's it's a, a nice thing. I know that. Now, Bob had shared with me that in the summer, your your coaches uh, had some uh, conditioning that they had you do out in the woods. You, you well, uh, yeah, the, all this around here was timber in them days. And uh, very little the place that I was taken up by uh, either farmers or uh, or by Wheelersburg. But uh, us boys would cut timber during the uh, summer months to stay in shape. Now we really really went at that just for that purpose, and we cut cordwood, paper wood, and that was, that was a hard job there because you had to peel the bark off of it. And, and we got, about, I think, about three dollars a cord for it. And it took us about two days to cut a cord. So between two or three of us cutting the cord, we wasn't getting much money. But uh, that's the way we stayed in shape. And then we never, we never, we never uh, rode to go anywhere. And if I like, even to go to school, we run to school. And and uh, if we want to go to Portsmouth, we run to Portsmouth. That's and they're down to New Boston because we never once uh, coached in for us not to uh, start case. We had a streetcar line run down through here then, and uh, run right over there next to um, uh, Bob Evans. That was a streetcar line run down through there. And it only cost you a nickel to go to town, but the uh, coach told us not to go right on them streetcars, but to run it down there. And that's the way we did. Wherever we went, we run. Speaking of, of running and, and going away, it, my understanding is that back then we didn't, uh, the Buccaneers, uh, which are now the Pirates, didn't have a home field, so you guys had to play all your games away, is that correct? That's, that's right. The only, the only game we ever played here was what I told you, was one time we played the Portsmouth, and they didn't like the idea of playing in a cow faster. <laughs> <laughs> now back then... Uh, the uh, Willisburg, the the mascot, I guess, was the Buccaneer. Is that correct? Well, the same as it was right now. The Willisburg Pirates, and the uh, Pirate is a Buccaneer. Right. You know? So I was, a lot of them referred to us as the Buccaneers all the time. Right. But we were really the Pirates, orange and black. Now, did uh, it was uh, in terms of your conference you were in? What uh, could you share that with us? A, a conference for, of the schools. Well, we were in what they call Big Six, and uh, but we played outside the conference. Oh, we played uh, any number of schools outside uh, fell in, and but uh, with the uh, Big Six there, we just about uh, until us boys graduated, we just about uh, took every game around. We just just we were just just a bunch of. Of uh, big boys and men was 
really, really good, good at our game. And you mentioned um, in terms of people, it, it sounds like there was a lot of community support at that time. You mentioned Mr. Fucci helping you with the cleats. and the, Could you talk a little bit about him? Well, Mr. Fucci, uh, he run a, um, a, a repair shop shoe shop uh, up or close to down that street from Methodist. In fact, it's right in back of the Methodist. But uh, us boys, uh, when we didn't, uh, we'd buy no pair of shoes, uh, we'd take them to him and him, uh, he'd repair them for us. And if they had become uh, uh, something like torn or anything like that, Mr. Fuchsia would repair them, never charge us a penny. Huh. That's great. That's great. And now you mentioned some of the teachers and, and coaches, and I think uh, some people that uh, I heard you mention was Coach Osborne. Is that correct? He, you had a yeah. special fondness for him. Can you share a little bit about him and, and why he was a, a special man to you? Well, Osborne and uh, Fowler both, I think they both, and probably Mr. Hall, I think they must have played football in, uh, in, uh, in college. I'm not sure. But Osborne was about, well, he was a little over six foot tall, and uh, he was the kind of a person, you know, that would just mingle, just right in with the crowd. he just become one of you. And he was always ready to uh, comment on, on us or help us out. And he was the assistant coach. And uh, Osborne was just, just a fine person, but so was Fowler. But Fowler was a little more sterner. And uh, I, I don't know whatever happened to him after he left Wheelersburg. But Fowler uh, was one of these persons that uh, uh, when he told you to, what to do, you better do it. Now, he, I don't mean he would he would bore you out or anything like that. Right. But uh, he would make you know that you had made a mistake, which was really, really good. Right. And now, you, you mentioned playing two years and... Uh, I think uh, Bob and, and Coach Eaton have shared with me that um, you have a really a memory that's kind of stuck with you for probably a little over 70 years of a specific game and a specific play. Can you share that with us uh, from your football days? Well, the, the one that stands most in my mind in, in football was when we played Greenfield. And uh, I called that game to be lost. Uh, we had a play, we played from uh, a modified punt formation, and then we played single wing back right and left. And this happened to be, uh, uh, was single wing day and back left, and um, what I was supposed to do was just uh, clip the uh, guard that was after me and clip the uh, right end, or be their left end rather, and uh, then go and run interference for the um, for the uh, right end, it was who would be pick up a, a short shovel pass. And uh, as I run across the run by, I, I grabbed the tackle and I just pulled him by his uh, his pants, you know, and gave him a little pull. And he was already leaning over and ready to tell me. So he went on his face, and I clipped the uh, the, the uh, their left end, and then I cut right straight across. And in back of them to run interference for uh, for the uh, right uh, left end over there with uh, they was, uh, had uh, taken the little shovel pass, and this big tackle came out of the um, line there, and he clipped me, and and, and uh, this one fellow was coming through. I don't know what, just exactly what he was, but he was probably one of the backfield. He was coming through to make the tackle on the uh, right end, but when this when I got Clipped, it throwed me right into the back of this uh, tackle, and you know, to me it was it was, couldn't be helped. Uh, and so uh, anyway, uh, um, pain went on, made the touch, winning touchdown, and uh, coaches they called it back and said that I clipped, but in what it almost called a free for all. Now I never seen so many people ready to fight. <laughs> I'll run and them go, but they all see now that. Uh, they watched them games pretty close, and they? they saw what happened. Right. And they go anyway. They called it back, and Osborne and uh, and uh, Fowler and, and uh, 
was, and the, and the, the uh, teams were ready to go, ready to really fight. I mean it. <laughs> but uh, Stanley Hall, he was always calm about everything. And he'd come out there on the field then, and he calmed everything down. But they still, we still uh, lost that game. And that's, so I, I think uh, with an athlete like yourself, sometimes those are the things you remember as opposed to a, a big play you make. You might, uh, you remember the things that kind of hurt, hurt you in the end. I, I think I, I was sharing with uh, Coach Eaton just earlier the games I, I remember are the ones that I played poorly. And so I think that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's just an athlete that, uh, that, that happens to him. Now, I, I understand you were also a real good track athlete. Could you talk a little bit about your track career at Williamsburg? Well, uh, my mother said if she ever caught me walking, she'd faint. And I said, begin with, and I love track. And I threw the javelin. I was a good javelin thrower. We had to throw the name of, of the hall. He was a state champion. And I was second to him in the javelin throw. And... Uh, I run the half mile and I run the um, the uh, uh, 440 on the uh, mile relay. And uh, but by being in the half mile back in injury, I don't know how it is now, but you could only go into two other uh, events if you run a, run a distant uh, run. By running the half mile, I could only enter, and uh, I could have maybe picked up a uh, second place in the shot and things like that if uh, if I could have. Taken, but they wouldn't let you. Now you had an interesting story for Coach Eaton about um, up at Ohio State and a, and a pretty uh, famous person you met up at Ohio State. Yes, uh, we were up there on our state meet, and by the way, we won them state meets. We were up there on the, on that on, on that, and uh, we watched Jesse Owens. He was out on the track, and he came around, and the, and the, he. Up just down below us a little bit, and of course we had the, our our whole crew and the teachers are all up there. And the uh, uh, coach told me that I better go warm up a little bit because the half mile was coming up. And uh, I walked down there, and uh, Jeffy Owens was leaning up against the fence there. And as I went past, I asked him and stopped and talked to him, you know. And, and I, and I told him, well, I said, I've got to get on out here. The coach told me to warm up. He said, you're the half mile? And I said, yes. Yeah. He said, would you like me to pace you around there? And I said, oh, that's wonderful. So he paced me that half mile around there. Huh. And I'm telling you, that man, I don't believe his feet ever touched the ground. He just seemed to float along. Hmm. But he never tried to show me up or nothing right. like that. He wasn't that kind of person. He was the most polite man I ever met in my life. But he went around, he paced me around that uh, track, and now and then he would uh, pick up a little bit to see if I'd pick up, you know. Right, right. But he was he was quite a person, and I really enjoyed it. And as we come back, well, one of the teachers wanted me to, to, she had a box camera, and she wanted me to go down and take his picture, and I did. And uh, I took two of his pictures standing there. Hmm. Of course, I never got one of them. <laughs> and I'll never forget him running with me. Well, I tell you what, that's a heck of a memory. Most yeah. people can't say they well, ran with an Olympic champion. Well, you know, I remember later when after he, well, he never was treated right. And uh, after he come back uh, from the Olympics, I remember uh, I went in, I was in the service, and he went to um, Cuba down there, and he, now this is the kind of things he done. He went to Cuba down there and run against a racehorse and won. You know, he had a real fast start. He could ball when he he left him, left him uh, uh, fields there. And when he got ready to leave, he was gone like a shot. And he ran against the racehorse down there and won. It was just short distance. Yeah, I remember seeing that. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if I saw that on a short film or saw it in a book or what, but I do remember yeah. seeing that. Now, after... After high school, you said you went straight into the service, into the Navy. Could you share a little bit about your uh, service career? Well, um, I wasn't in the, in the service very long until I left for Europe. And uh, we were supposed to go over there for three years. 
And uh, so I, I just had enough time to go over there, you know, before re-enlistment. But uh, just as we got over there, why Germany started acting up, and the next thing you know, we, everybody was in the war with the exception of us. Mm-hmm. And we was hauling out or uh, taking out the uh, uh, embassies from uh, Spain and down in Africa and Italy and places like that. We'd haul them um, to, um, uh, to the east coast of, uh, or west coast of, uh, of Portugal and they'd load them aboard uh, our um, transports back home. And uh, But we went from there right into right into um, uh, convoying uh, and uh, for a year it was funny you know everybody was uh, talking about it and all the rest of them in the war well now the Navy was in the war there a year before we ever declared war but, yeah and because we jumping on in Germans and we was running convoys in the, into into uh, Ireland yeah, and, we and were, out uh, we run openly and uh, the um, uh, Germans, they sacked one of our destroyers, and we screamed loud and clear about it, you know. And, but uh, I don't know how many submarines we had sunk theirs before we ever did that. Right. Because uh, we were convoying, and we were we were into that war just as much as anybody right. else. Well, I know with the with the FDR and kind of the Lend Lease program where yeah. we gave them a lot of supplies before, as you mentioned, before we actually got into the war. And uh, can you share a little bit after the after the end of the war, uh, the euphoria that was around, were you still in the service? Did you come back home or did you stay over there? Or? No, um, I was in the, uh, no, in the invasion of uh, Africa and invasion of Sicily and uh, Italy, and then I came around and run convoys into uh, into uh, northern part of France, or where we uh, and I run convoys around the uh, what we call the Horn up there, around Newfoundland, uh, down in the, into there, uh, which was very dangerous. But uh, after that was over with. Well, uh, the war began to die down. It was just a matter of finding a submarine every now and then and, and pounding on him. And, and I got kind of fed up with that. And, and uh, they were just getting into, really getting into the war in, uh, in, the, in the Pacific. So I put in for a transfer to, to the Pacific. And uh, I was transferred to the West Coast. And then they sent me on to, uh, to a cruiser. And I was in the invasion of the uh, of the Commodores, and then the invasion of uh, the uh, Aleutians. And then we uh, come down through the uh, uh, that would be the China Sea down through there. We we was worked down through there until we got down to the southern part. And then we were interceptors for uh, these Kamikazes uh, heading for uh, for the fleet. And we was, uh, but uh, that wasn't fun at all because the uh, thing would come in on you and if you didn't shoot them down, you got hit. <laughs> so uh, then uh, then after that was over, while well, we moved, uh, they sent us back uh, north, our our fleet back north, which is next to the Aleutians, and that's when uh, they declared uh, armistice and then we occupied uh, northern Hanshu home and not in northern Hanshu but before we could go in there the uh, jets had to come out there and clean the bay of uh, of uh, death charges and I'm telling you just, they were just so thick it, for two nights and days they'd cut them loose and then we'd open on with the machine guns and uh, I'm telling you that they were just you could, there was no sleeping for two days and nights before we could go in there. And then we went into the, for the occupation. A lot of little things happened like during that occupation too. <laughs> One of the Japanese uh, uh, leaders over there, he came over and he handed me his his sword. And I had no business getting it at all because I was just an enlisted man, you know. Right. And, uh, but, uh, I took it, and, uh, went back aboard ship, 
and the boys and all the all the all the uh, servicemen are coming piled up their weapons at our feet, you know. And the servicemen, all of us, was over there in the occupation. Well, we took something from it, but uh, then the uh, I guess the admiral caused it. He told that everybody that had anything like that to bring them up on deck and pile them up. So there went my sword. There went your sword. So you you lost your souvenir. Now, now at the end of the war and then moving on, you said that um, you you spent over thir- thirty years in the service. Is that correct? Yes. And then after service, you did you come back directly to Willisburg or did you go somewhere? No, the um, only thing that I did and uh, did uh, did after I came out after the war was over and everything, I went into um, putting ships out of commission down in Green Cove Springs in Florida. And that was a, just a drag again, nothing happening, you know. And so uh, I put in, uh, my time was up, and so I shipped over, but I shipped over with, uh, with, the, uh, with the request that I'd be put on, back into the uh, fleet again. And so that's when we went for the occupation then of uh, France and, and Italy, and we stayed over there then for, we'd make rotations over there for 11 months. And, kind of broke up the monotony. But once you're in combat for that many years, you just don't, uh, you just can't walk out of it. It, you, it better life becomes very dread, tragedy to you. I mean, so you you liked being uh, where the action was then? I, 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 well, yeah, you know, I used to make, make, make people mad, you know, especially my sisters when I told them I enjoyed combat. Hmm. And that's just the way I feel right today. Well, it's interesting, very interesting. Now, if you could give um, some advice to the young men in our community now that are playing sports, uh, you know, in terms of whatever sport they're playing, what what do you think you'd tell them uh, from your experience growing up? What what is some advice you might be able to give them? Well, number one thing, uh, you playing sports in school, you'll never forget them for the rest of your life. And uh, there'll be many times that you'll replace some of it in, in your life. But uh, my advice to anybody is, is to get physically fit for it because that's one thing. You can't play sports and, and have 10, 15 pounds, even that much, hanging on you that you don't need. Right. And uh, first, number one thing, too, is, is know to love the game. Love what you're doing. And then put your heart into it, and, and you'll enjoy it. And listen to what your coaches say, and and uh, to far the and the coaches, uh, the, you know, they've got to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, join with their men, and uh, too, you know, and and be able to explain things to them, and and get their respect. Mm-hmm. That's the way with Osborne and Fowler. Like I said before, if, if I was to go into combat, then there would be two, two men I'd, I'd, I'd like to have followed. That, that's, that's a great compliment. You can't give anybody probably a better compliment than that. Um, Bob, can you think of anything that maybe we missed or um, that we need to bring into? One thing that uh, I failed to ask you about when you were in the Navy, I know Obviously, you played football and ran track at Wheelersburg, but at that time, uh, football was spread out uh, in terms of being played by people like yourself in the Navy. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, when the Naval Training Station had a football team, and uh, they was all pretty good-sized men, but uh, I, would, uh, I went on out for football when they made the call, and I made the team. And I played football for the station till I till I graduated from the, the uh, naval station, and I also was on the on little track team. But it was all it was all in my favor there because all the uh, most of the track was distant running, and uh, with especially the half mile and the mile, and I run both of them. But the uh, half mile I was ready for it by, by being in high school. Then when I went to the destroyers. And uh, from there, why well, you know, there's always competition between the between the squadrons, and we played football and and uh, 
had uh, all kinds of athletics, baseball, and we'd pull into an island, a deserted island, and we'd all go over and, and have a big uh, ball game, either football or baseball. But uh, we was recognized on our destroyers as, as having a football team that uh, could just about take on anything in the fleet. But there's one thing that, uh, that, that I would like to tell you. When I, I was stationed in Portugal, Elizabeth, Portugal, there for about six months, and our ship was there, and uh, I belonged to Gymnastic Club Portugal. I go over there and work out every evening, and, and uh, uh, I got to explain with them, with the boys there, and uh, they, they challenged us to a football game. So, uh, oh, I thought, boy, that's just right up our alley. And I told them, yes, sir. I said, well, when we started, and they told us and where, where the game was going to be. But, so we were there, guy, we go, we suited up, and we had uh, our uniform. And we went up our back field, and we was running plays. But, you know, I noticed that there was no goal post. And so we'd run plays there, and finally, uh, we got off there and, and uh, I got to talking to these people. And football to them was soccer ball. And so here we was all ready to take them on in football in uniform, and here they was all out there in shorts ready to play soccer. soccer. <laughs> <laughs> I never will forget that. Now, did, now you also, had, we had mentioned earlier, about the Big Six, could you talk a little bit about some of the teams in the Big Six that you can remember? Well, uh, uh, now Portsmouth wasn't in the Big Six, but we played them. Uh, there was, uh, I think, Greenfield and then this team up here in uh, by Arden, and I think Arden was in it, and uh, Oak Hill. Um, oh, I don't know. I could was it Sciotaville, maybe? Was there a Sciotaville? Yeah, yeah, Sciotaville was in it. And uh, was um, Notre Dame, what's now Notre, Notre Dame, Dame, but yeah. I don't know that they were called Notre Dame. Right, they was called Notre Dame. Were they, they called they Notre Dame? They always had a tough team. Um, so that, that was the conference that you guys played yeah. in then. Mm -hmm. hmm. well, we played outside of it, you know, uh, each Saturday we had a game. Oh, like with Portsmouth with Arn. Right. Now, one more thing I wanted to ask you about, and and I kind of we kind of alluded to that earlier with uh, Mr. Fushi and the, the other people. Can you talk a little bit about the support that the community gave the boys and and uh, and all your programs there at the high school? Well, it, it, I'll tell you, the people was was behind anything that uh, that the high school did. And uh, like I said, uh, do a furnish uh, a field to play in, and then uh, they furnish the field after uh, well, where the high school is down that bottom line. Right. They had a field down there, and uh, well, then the, the, like I said, the, the drugstore down there would furnish us ice cream and stuff after each team, each game. It, it, they, they, everybody was behind us. It, uh, it just seemed like wherever you go, uh, there was somebody uh, talking about your game. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, that's that's kind of the way it is now, and it's it's kind of uh, you know traditionally Wheelersburg's always been a uh, a good athletic community, and the, and the people really back the the programs along with the academics. It's a big. Uh, big boost to the kids I know at the high school in terms of academically and athletically the support they get from the community so we really appreciate you uh, talking with us today and uh, and I'm sure uh, this will be a big hit on our, our on our new website well I'll tell you something else uh, uh, I, people still stay in contact here with uh, Wheelersburg that are away from here, and, and uh, my, my, my brothers, my sisters, my, my uh, relatives, you know, and other people that are around here, they call me and ask me about this 
out there, you know, when they know the game's coming, they call and ask me how Wheelsburg make out. <laughs> but they seem like they're always winning. <laughs> yeah. I have an uncle that lives in, speaking of that, I have an uncle that lives in California, and he'll regularly get on the, the website to see how we're doing. They're out in California, so it's, it's neat that uh, people can see that now on the Internet and see how their home team's doing. Well, I see we've got the material here to to, uh, to have a winning team, and well, I think you've got some people to back you, and uh, some of these boys uh, are big, you know, <laughs> and make good linemen. We know oh, yeah. a big man <laughs> when I play there, but uh, we've got the material that can just about hold up to anybody. Well, thank you very much. Well, we appreciate you talking with us today. Mm-hmm.